right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I see we still got some people rolling in, so I'll give a couple minutes. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking your afternoon to join us. Uh, we're very, very excited. And welcome to Debugging the Future. Um, this is the first session, and we are thrilled to be here um, and to have our amazing guest for this session, um, which we are probably as excited to hear from as you all are. <laughs> Um, so the session we're going to go through, there will be a presentation, um, some information, um, and a Q&A at the end, as well as a take-home piece that we'll be sending out to all of the attendees uh, tomorrow. And so without further ado, I would love to introduce uh, today's session expert, who is Abron Maldonado, uh, who is the co-founder of Create Labs and an ambassador for OpenAI, which is a company that I am, maybe you've heard of, I don't know a little thing called chat GPT. Some people have been talking about it, I don't know. Um, but Abron is one of the leading experts and alpha testers for cutting edge AI technology, such as chat GPT, um, GPT-3, Codex, Dolly2, and other GANs. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Abron. Um, welcome, and yeah, we're super excited to hear from you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Alicia. This is, uh, this is gonna be fun. I think we're gonna cover a lot um, I'm open to any and all questions. And if there's nothing, if there's something that I can't answer, you know, the other ambassadors uh, can really support me and, and give you some follow up for sure. Um, so I think we need to start with the basics. It, it's it's uh, easy for us to just assume that everyone knows what we're talking about um, and assume that everyone's been on, you know, the interwebs as much as, as we have. But I think it's important to just set the tone and, and the baseline of, of what this is. So ChatGBT, was built on uh, GPT technology. Um, this technology generates text. It's a form of artificial intelligence. It's not all encompassing of all aspects of artificial intelligence. This is a, a language model. Um, it is a transformer uh, language model. And uh, it tries to predict text. It's basically the, the simplest way to put it. it. It tries to think about what you want to say next when you input a starter text. So you can go what they call zero shot without any examples. You can go uh, single or few shot, they call it, when you give it multiple examples. So now GPT-3 was released back in 2020 to a private beta group. That's when I gained access to it in that initial private beta. Um, GPT-3 went through many iterations, but it was just a playground. So now the playground was just a blank canvas of like, what could you build with this technology? Um, and it was difficult. Not a lot of people got it. You know, I tried to show it to a lot of people who went over a lot of people's heads and they were like, yeah, I don't know what I'm looking at here. And then OpenAI did an amazing thing um, for the UX students out there. They just changed the UI, basically. They're like, you know, we're going to pre-build pre with some presets, our own chatbot to allow people to interact with GPT-3 and give it a chat interface and simply just call it chat GPT. And who knew that that would set, you know, a, a, the course of that we are on now with, with ChatGPT. So now ChatGPT is basically a, a pre-designed with prompts that OpenAI has set into the, the training of, of ChatGPT, reinforced it with some feedback on what are the best responses to give back and release that to the public. And now we are now we're here with ChatGPT. So what I do want to cover today, uh, uh, me and a couple of the ambassadors got together to put together some, some basic examples of what we think might be helpful when doing what's called prompt engineering um, and working within ChatGPT. Now, we can also touch on what it means to work within the playground of GPT proper. Um, that could be its own session. Um, but ultimately, you know, let's start with ChatGPT since that's the one that everyone is using and it's the easiest to use. Uh, and there's still quite a bit of prompting that you could do within ChatGPT itself before you get into the playground and get into the actual, what they call a platform. Um, so I'm gonna grab, oh, okay, great. So yeah, yeah, um, I'm gonna grab the screen share here and then um, I'll show some examples. Could I get the- Yeah. Oh, oh perfect. Um, let me see. Yep, perfect. I got it. Should be good, great. Awesome. Can you see my screen where it says prompt engineering? Good. Okay. Awesome. 
So prompt engineering, simply put, is just the instructions and examples that you provide the language model in natural plain language, which is why they call it NLP, natural language processing, to just guide the AI to your desired result. It's, it's You're talking to the machine. And now I do office hours where I meet with a lot of software engineers, and they're confused as to where to start because they think about things in a computational way with a, a keystroke, a command. And they're like, all right, what, what's the command that I need to put in to get this output? I'm like, ain't no command. <laughs> you just talk to the machine. You say, hello, this is what I want to do today. This is what I'm going to give you. This is what I expect back. Here's an example of what I'm going to give you. Here's an example of what I want to return. OK, let's begin. Please. You say please and thank you, and then you're off to the races. It's really that simple. OK. so. In one example of like, what is a bad prompt? You just say, what, is, what should I eat tonight, right? Now, it's going to try and predict what you like, what your preferences are. You could literally put anything in your mouth. It doesn't know if it means breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It doesn't know if you're trying to keep to a restrictive diet. It doesn't know if you're trying to go keto, what your allergies are. It doesn't know anything. So you're not giving it enough structure and guardrails to what to stay within. Um, rather, if you say, what should I eat tonight? I'm trying to eat something that's very healthy, not too oily, and helps me build muscle. Okay, now it knows where to go, right? Now it's providing examples. Here you go. Many options for a healthy muscle building meal that is not too oily. Here are some suggestions. Grilled chicken, salmon, quinoa, tofu, lentil soup, turkey, meatballs. Okay, and then it follows up. Remember to drink plenty of water throughout the day. Now you have a thread. So now this could become its own rabbit hole, right? Because now that it understands this is a safe thread. And when you go on ChatGPT, you have a bunch in this left sidebar of safe threads. Utilize those, always return to those. Think of those as like the memory of each of those threads that you want to go down. So now just because you started this conversation, you now have a personal meal manager for you always because it already has this previous context and you build upon that the next time you speak to it. So you say, okay, I'm going on a trip. You know I want to stay healthy. You don't even need to give any more context. You just say, okay, I'm going on a trip. There's not a lot of good options, um, but I want to have a cheat day. Go. That's it. You don't need to reiterate any of the previous instructions because it understands where you're picking up. Now, some coding examples. So there, there are a lot of use cases where the, you could be a coding beginner or a coding novice with ChatGPT now as it evolves to GPT-4 but this was possible with three and 3.5, where you can say, hey, I'm starting out with Python. Can you give me just some step-by-step -step instructions um, and, and where to start and where to get these learning resources? Step-by-step, -step, it will give you everything that you need to know. Um, it will give you everything that you might get from, from the internet. Now, the, the battle here, and this could be you know a, a side tangent that we get into later with your questions of like, Googling versus ChatGPT, right? Or whatever that verb is going to end up becoming. Um, with Googling, it's going to provide search results. It's going to ask you to comb through pages and pages of results. And that's done on purpose because Google sells ad revenue to those pages. Now, in this case, it just wants to provide you the exact answer that you're looking for. So it's going to make that decision of like, all right, you could search these pages, but when you discover the page that has the right resource, that's what I'm going to give you. It's not finding it for you. It's just finding it within its own knowledge base of what they call the parameter set. So I should have touched on that when we talked about what is the ChatGPT. It's based on an offline time-stamped data dump of data called parameters. Think of parameters as like a nugget of information, like a word or a phrase. It's trained on 175 billion nodes of parameters. So pretty much anything is covered in there. And now your prompting is trying to surf through all that to try and extract the right information back to you. Um, so now you're coding, you're running into an error, you don't know how to debug it. This is where you would stage it and say, okay, I'm running into an error. It says setup failed one or more issues, caused the setup to fail, please fix the issue and then retry the setup. Um, how do I fix this? There you go. You can take any error, any debugging um, instance into ChatGPT, it's already seen it. 
And if you ask it for a string of code, it's going to provide you that string of code as well. So because it also generates code. So ChatGPT is almost like the culmination of the innovation that happened with Copilot and Codex and, and ChatGPT and even Dolly. It understands all of that in one culminating tool. So now generating examples, I think, is, is a big one. And, and a lot of this is going to come into play when we think about synthetic data, right? And generating data to train it yourself on the things that you want to see um, and you need more examples of. Um, with, with studying, you know, uh, I would like to act as an example generator for students when confronted with new complex concepts, adding many and varied examples help students better understand moving that zoom thing, uh, those concepts. I would like you to ask what concept I would like. Blah, 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 blah. Of course, happy to generate those examples. Okay, boom, opportunity cost to college students. Now, once you have this kind of layout of like, all right, I want you to be an example generator. And it says, okay, I understand I'm going to be an example generator. Whatever the next Y variable is, doesn't matter in this thread. So now that it understands it's generating examples, every time you input, it could be a different thing that you wanted to generate examples for. You don't need to start a whole new thread for each new example set. It just understands out the gate, I'm an example generator, give me anything and I'll take it from there. So now plugins. Plugins is like the new frontier with ChatGPT. I don't even know. So now being an ambassador, I get access to all of the future models to test, to provide feedback, to work with the product managers, to work with the internal leadership, and to show them what's, what's possible with a use case. Because remember, OpenAI just creates the technology. And then they need people to test with that technology to come up with new ideas there's some academic students out there that generate white papers off of some of these use cases. Internally, we just meet weekly and we say, hey, this is what I see. This is what I see from the community. This is what I've tested out myself. These are the demos that I came up with. Um, so with that said, I don't know what you have access to <laughs> because I have access to, to, to models that I might speak to. And I'm like, oh, you don't have that yet? Okay, so for instance, where it says here, alpha, this is a plugin example with Wolfram Alpha. And I think this is available, I'm not sure. So Wolfram Alpha is a whole nother like knowledge-based AI organization that does great work. They have great study materials and, and I'm sure you've come across their work in, in your college uh, endeavors. But here you could then ask it a question while Wolfram Alpha is plugged into the system. So now you're tapping into the Wolfram Alpha knowledge base, not just the 175B. Now it's 175B plus Wolfram Alpha and all of their literature. So Think about what that means for studying. Okay, um, what does the graph of a sin function look like? So now it's tapping into Wolfram Alpha. It'll do a little spinny wheel here and then give you exactly what that looks like, pulling from that data set. All right, what is the Fourier transform of, I'm not gonna try and say that, with an initial variable of T and a transform variable of W. And then it works out the formulas for you. This is brand new. ChatGPT could not do this earlier, nor could GPT-3 in the earlier iterations of doing math or giving you proper formulas. It'll do what's called hallucinate, which means like, I'm never gonna say, I don't know. Rarely, unless it's programmed to say, I don't know, it's gonna make up something along the way and just give you BS. Where here, it doesn't have to do that because if it doesn't know the answer, it's going to tap into the plugin and provide that information for you with trusted resources and trusted experts providing that data. So summarization is, is a whole nother area too. I think this is probably gonna be the most useful tool for you um, out the gate where you're gonna have research papers that you're gonna read. And I think the window now is either 4K or 8K, and this is in tokens. So a token also is not a character. It's also not a word. It's maybe four or five letters, I want to say, or four or five characters. Um, so there is a, a, a calculation of tokens versus words. So I think the, the, the token context window, as they say, of like how much information you can give it at a time is somewhere between 4,000 and 8,000 tokens. So think of it as, you know, 
five to seven pages at a time. Um, if it's 8,000, I think that's probably higher to about 12 or 13 pages of content that you can provide at a time to say, okay, can you just summarize this for me? So if you have a research article that you're trying to read, if you're trying to go through really high level scientific data that you don't understand legalese, right? If there's a legal contract, if you got some, you know, employee handbook, you know, you got your new, your first internship or your first job, and it gives you this big stack of literature that you need to read through. Um, you say, hey, can you just read through this and just give me the TLDR, give me a summary, or you just start asking questions against it. Um, I'm a big geek, uh, not only with AI, but with sci-fi and with UFOs. So what I did was got my hands on the uh, PDF of the most recent UFO report <laughs> from, the, the, from the Pentagon and said, great, I'm not going to read this big paper, uh, put it in here. And then I start asking questions against it, like where are UFOs most commonly found or what is the shape that most people commonly see? Uh, what part of the earth do they visit the most? Um, what is Congress saying about next steps? And I'm now I'm just, I have a little UFO expert with me uh, on my on my laptop. Um, but again, you can just say simply here, summarize this abstract for a second grader. Now, obviously you're not in second grade, but what it tells is that it wants to break this down, this summary, not only in the same high level academic language that it was written in, but in plain language. Right. And you don't, and I'm careful to even say plain English because this does this multilingually. So you don't need to just have this translated into English. You could have this translated in simple language to whatever language you prefer. So something like this for like the summarization prompts, would you, for educators specifically, would they be able to feed it, um, let's say their curriculum for the semester to be able to give students like an overview of what to expect in the semester? hundred percent. You know, it, again, you're, the only limit right now is the context window. So you could even do it in chunks. You could give it a page at a time, you know, and that's usually how we do it when we do this for business is that if someone has a large context data set, we then do it in chunks, right? And we just make sure that we give it, you know, a few pages at a time, but ultimately it'll, it can do exactly that. Very interesting. So there's no real kind of limit to how much it can digest at once other than, I mean, you mentioned the tokens, but it mm -hmm. does kind of work better with the briefer, concise information. So taking it as smaller portions than just a giant data set at once. Yes. And that 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 is a opportunity that is coming up. And it's something that I do professionally now, where as an agency per, uh, specializing in, in generative AI and ChatGPT, big companies ask like, hey, I want to develop something uh, just on our data. Right. And they have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of pages, you know, or tokens of, of data that they want to send us. So there are things now with the open source lang chain and data retrieval, which is like a new feature that's coming out with with OpenAI. Then some of it is, is open source where you can program it to embed and index a large data set and then prompt against that. So that is something that that is possible. But out the gate with ChatGPT, it's not. Because remember, ChatGPT is, is kind of like the open AI user-facing product, right? Yeah. Like consumer product. So we'll, we'll get into the other things of like what you can do beyond just this. These are just a few examples. Um, but I do want to cover some, you know, there's a lot of polarizing reactions to using this in college and the do's and don'ts. And we're going to get into that. But I want to... I want to show you a couple images. So this is from an old 80s movie called Real Genius, right? Typical college lecture hall, students in class. But someone came up with the idea like, you know what? I don't need to be here. There's an invention called the tape recorder. <laughs> so slowly but surely, <laughs> more and more students started to skip class and just have their tape recorder kind of in place. And then oh, slowly, <laughs> more and more students we're leaving class and just automating the process of attending class. And then the teacher got hip to it too. And then also <laughs> did the same thing. So we are almost kind of in its own microcosm seeing this paradigm shift of like, you know what, I can automate this. And the professors are like, you know what, I can automate it too. So if you're going to automate it, I'm going to automate it. And there, there is going to be this, it's going to be clunky at first. Um, and um, it, it's going to be misstep 
Well, let's get into that now. And I'll hand it over back to you, Rebecca, and we can go over some of those Great. do's and don'ts. Wonderful. Oh, here we go. Why is it? There we go. And we're, we're saving these questions, right? There's some good ones here that I want to get Oh, to. yes. <laughs> yeah, there's some very, very good ones there. Uh, where am I here? OK. No. There we go. Um, so hop back to this one. Perfect. Or we'll start right at the beginning again. You guys get to see a bronze lovely face again. There we go. Um, yeah, so we, we wanted to kind of discuss a little bit, A, how students are going to be using it and how professors and educators can kind of look at that and say, OK, this is where we can expect students to use it. So this is where we should kind of um, be looking out. So I will hop to the, the top five do's and don'ts for students. Um, so what educators can kind of be looking out for and how they can message this to their their own classes. Absolutely. So definitely think of it as as a supplemental tool right now. You know, a lot of people compared it to this is the calculator moment for text. And that's that's true in a lot of ways. Um, we didn't now, now. I don't know how, you know, some of you in the room remember there was a lot of controversy with calculators in, in math class. And so there was, it, that wasn't a smooth transition either. Um, so there are steps here that I've, I've been paying attention to, to professors on, on my LinkedIn and, and some examples. I work with NYU and seeing what some professors there have, have instituted and in, in doing some research. Uh, I saw, you know, Princeton at first, you know, every, a lot of schools have put out their statements around how it's allowed to be used. But, and just uh, what, I think is a good baseline um, are, are some of these fives here. So use language models as a supplementary tool for brainstorming ideas, starting points for research and writing. Currently, I'm writing a script with OpenAI, ChatGPT, and it's going very well. Where I'm still, I'm still the, the Spielberg in the room. It's still my idea. I'm still the Jordan Peele. I have a vision and it's helping me kind of stage that vision, come up with the treatment idea, come up with the settings, you know, maybe come up with some starter dialogue, like, okay, I have a scene with these two characters, give me the opening line, right? And I've heard from filmmakers that sometimes you need the opening scene and the closing scene to bookend, and then the rest will kind of write itself in between. So definitely use it as a brainstorming tool uh, in that sense. Um, language skills. Now, I know that there's Duolingo out there, but there's so many things that can happen that are unscripted. A lot of those apps that are out there go by scripted education for learn this and then it's very linear. With here, you can just use it as a personal language assistant to explore different foreign languages. And that's probably one of the strongest aspects of this tool is how multilingual it is uh, for doing all this. Um, three is a big one for me and I've tweeted this and, and it I went mini viral of, you know, world builders. And I mentioned like Spielberg and Jordan Peele and the George Lucas effect of, you know, for a long time, those people were, were highly touted for their imaginative sense and be creativity and because they were world builders, but they were also a specialist as a filmmaker, as an author, as a film producer, director, where a lot of you can become world builders now. A lot of these tools, and I don't mean just ChatGPT, ChatGPT, Midjourney, Dolly can help you come up with your own world building concepts that you could then translate to a book, to a video game, to a film, to 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 anything really as a creative output. Um, but exploring those concepts and getting, you know, those storyboards created with which ChatGPT. Um, and, you know, citing AI generated content appropriately is, is important, being transparent about where you're using this. Um, and in some respects, you can ask ChatGPT that's a great answer. Where did you get that information? Um, a lot of people haven't tried that. So I would say definitely try that, but also verify if the citations that it provided you are actually true, because sometimes it'll just make stuff up as well. Um, and study, right? It, think of it as a personal tutor, study assistant in the room with you 24 seven, right? You can say, hey, I'm struggling with this section of the test. I'm not quite getting it. So think of this as like the futuristic version of flash flashcards where you say, okay, you know, 
you know, tutor me on this topic. Let's go through some quizzes. That, can we make like a pop quiz right now? Sure, no problem. Here's 20 questions. Bam. And it'll do that. And then you say, okay, here are my answers. Grade it for me. Or give me feedback on how I wrote this. It can do all of that for you. So it's really endless. So it's like a 24, open 24-7 24 study buddy. <laughs> exactly. For sure. Um, what not to do, right? So I think the, 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 the hidden not to do here is run from it and treat it as a taboo because it's not going anywhere, right? So this is the way to embrace it, but embrace it responsibly. So don't submit AI generated work as your own work and not be transparent about its contributions. We've all done it. I've done it. You know, I'm, I'm working, someone's asking me for something and I'm like, I don't have time. I don't have four hours to dedicate to that. So chat, GPT, all right, here you go, done, right? And I've done it first, for example, like, uh, you know, I, I was hiring staff and someone was like, I, I need that HR was like, we need that job description. We need that JD, we need that JD. I'm like, I, I don't have time. So I told ChatGPT, hey, I need a job description for this project manager doing X, Y, and Z. Bam, here you go. Boom, submitted, done, person hired. No one got hurt, right? Hired a great talent, it generated it for me. Um, for research and study, now remember, it does hallucinate. It can give you false information. It's, it, it is a people pleaser. It wants to give you information. It will never say, mm, I'm not sure about that, so I'm not going to give you anything. They're training it better to do that more often, but for the most part, it's going to say, you want something from me, so I'm going to give it to you. Whether it's true or not is not up to me, right? So you do have to cross-reference the information that is given to you by the system. Um, again, the one and three are kind of similar, but you know, just make sure that you're on the same page with your instructor, with your professor. Like, look, I am going to use ChatGPT for portions of this, and your instructor will look at these do's and don'ts and come up with their own ideas for like, you know what? This is okay, but this isn't. Or just be transparent of like, and also I've seen professors even like slap a paper on the door. Like if you're gonna use it, it has to be done in this way with their own do's and don'ts. And one way is you have to justify why you used it, right? Like you really couldn't come up with that on your own or you couldn't do this research without it. Like in what way did it give you, bring value to your project and not just be a shortcut? And, and you have to justify that. Uh, you know, don't use it obviously for, for exams and, and quizzes. Um, although I would say as a professor, if you do want to use it for to generate quizzes, are you holding yourself to that same accountability as your students, right? Like there are a lot of short, this doesn't just apply to students because there are a lot of shortcuts that faculty can take with using uh, with this and you, you can use it to grade your papers. You can use it to come up with quizzes and, and, and assessments. Um, whether that improves the, the classroom, that, that's not for me to determine. Um, and also most, impo most importantly is don't, don't ignore the biases in these models. And, and my team is working tirelessly to generate models that are intentionally non-biased, that are diverse and equitable. We just released DEI GPT you know, as, as one of those tools. And it's important for you to think about that the AI is not biased. It is a slice of society. So it's going to bring with it the bias in society. So whatever that slice is that it took from our collective consciousness and the biases that are there, it's going to exist in this AI as well. And when you see articles out there like AI does something racist, no, no, no. The Abron behind it didn't guardrail it enough to stop it from being racist, right? So the human behind, the prompt engineer behind it uh, doesn't get enough blame for setting those restrictions and guardrails to, to protect it. Interesting. So these are some of the bigger questions and I get this a lot when I do the education talks of how will we change the way we learn? What are the new skills? And, and what are the, the traditional ways that we teach and learn that might shift or go away or present new opportunities? And for the faculty in the room and for the educators, and, and this applies to K-12 too when I speak to them, 10, 12 years ago, I was doing my PhD on 21st century skills and, and millennial intelligence and creative ways to learn. And a lot of folks focused on like learning skill, uh, um, learning styles, right? It, it, it's way deeper than that. Um, at the time, there was a book by Levy and Renane, The Division of Labor, Daniel Payne, 
he wrote a lot on 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 the right brain uh, side of your brain. Uh, there were so many books that touched on the 21st century skills and what it known what did that mean? So the 21st century skills meant that automation is coming, and these are the skills that you need to focus on and hone in schools or for yourself as a self learner to coexist with automation. Right? These are the things that computers are going to be able to do really well. So stay above that by doing these skills really well. And one of the one of the the mantras that came out were the four C's. Those four C's were creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking, right? Because it realized computers are really bad at thinking on its feet with problem solving of something that didn't fall into an if-then logic, right? Computers are really good with if-then logic. So that also meant that if you were working a job or if you have a major where most of the work is based on if-then logic, if you see this, then do that, that will soon become automated, right? Full stop. So think about what field you're entering or what job skills that you need for your life that rely more on creativity, that rely more on critical thinking, problem solving, like uh, unforeseen problem solving, plan Bs. How good are you with contingency plans when, when something comes up that you didn't expect, right? You have to rely on, on, on these skills and also being a self-learner, knowing the best way that you learn to bring yourself up to speed with these tools because what we hear a lot now is that you're not gonna be replaced by AI, you're gonna be, be replaced by someone who knows how to use AI. Um, so, so be open-minded in, in learning these skills. Um, and then from, a, from an assessment standpoint and how the classroom is, is being taught, that falls on the educators, that falls on the professors of like, you, we, we got comfortable assessing in this way, grading in this way, Le, um, you know, uh, um, identifying learned skill, knowledge retention in these ways, that a lot of those ways are, are in an old form and in, in, in are very traditional that are now being disrupted by AI. So what are the new ways to truly measure knowledge retention? What are the new ways to truly show what is truly learned from that book, right? And if a, if a book report can be expedited in, in minutes through ChatGPT, then the book report doesn't matter anymore. What matters is what was the life skill that you wanted the students to learn from reading that book, right? What was the core themes in that book that the students need to walk away with as a core memory of like, you know what? My life was changed by that book because of X, Y, and Z. Not because I had to write a book report on it and I got an A. Book report is done, right? You could throw all the book reports out the, you know, or any, you know, true research papers that are just regurgitating and recalling information but it's more about what is the critical thinking takeaways that you're getting from that, from that research. Interesting. So it's kind of a shift more, I guess, similar to you mentioned earlier when the calculator was introduced and it was, you know, you got graded on whether or not you had the right or wrong answer prior to that. And now it's more how you got like the process, the work behind it, as opposed to the actual whether yes or no answer. It's a bit I see more. That, exactly. I see that with my own kids now with this new common core math of, you know, the, the, you're being graded on the work that went into solving that problem and the explanation. You see a lot of that now. It's like, explain how you got to this answer. And you, if you can't articulate the points in, in, in the work that you're doing uh, properly, then you're going to suffer not only in college, but also with AI. Because communication skills and being able to articulate um, are going to be valued and very important for how you use ChatGPT. You have to explain what you need in a very detailed manner. And, and if you have a hard time with that, then AI is going to, is not going to give you the best outputs. Awesome. Cool. So this is, this is still to be determined because we've seen efforts to detect watermark, um, but it's missing the point. So Let's say, yes, GPT-0 can detect or we can watermark things and you could send an email and automatically it'll detect this was AI generated. So now we're doing what's called the red lettering effect, right? Where we're now indicating that all AI is basically spam, right? Because the same way your phishing tools can identify what a spam email is or an auto-generated email, your perception of that email now is different. 
but oh, I don't want that. I actually, I use Superhuman for those of you who know email tools. I use Superhuman and it separates an email that was auto generated and an email that was generated by a human. I only check emails that were generated by humans directly. Anything that was auto generated, it just sits in a in a, another inbox collecting dust. So if we start to do that with AI, then we're basically putting this negative perception on AI generated content and saying, oh, I'm not gonna open that email that was AI generated. However, if you use Grammarly, if you were just using AI to spell check your email, does that take away from the importance of that email simply because you used uh, AI from, from a grammar perspective or, or you are you know, new to English because it's your second or third language and you're using it to help you speak proper English via an email, right? So now all of a sudden, all those emails are now watermarked as, as AI, do we want to then put them aside? And now if, if that's the case, every email is going to be, if how many of you use Grammarly? Everything's going to be used, you know, um, or, or identified as, as AI. And then it's also going to be a rat race because there's going to be a plugin that's made that can detect GPT-3. What happened the following month? GPT-4 came out. Now that plugin needs to be updated. So that plugin is updated and then GPT-5 comes out and then it needs to be updated again. And now it's testing that on certain models, but then you have all these open source language models coming out where before it was easier because we could just focus on ChatGPT. That's not the case anymore. You look now on Git, there's tons of open source language models out there. Is that detection system also calibrated to those open source models? And those open source models are also protecting itself from not being detected. So it really is something that is a band-aid where we just need to embrace like I don't care if it's if it's AI generated. What's the core value to the content that was sent my way or that I'm reading here? Does it give me value? Is it contributing to something? Great. I, I create AI generated art. And one of the things that I that I say is it's not all official if it makes you feel something real. If I put out art out there and you're touched by that art, does it matter that I used AI? And it it it, it goes down more rabbit holes because for those of you who are artists and used Photoshop and used our graphic designers and used digital tools, you, you don't you're not holding a paintbrush in your hand. You've become an artist with graphic design tools, right? For for a digital sculptor, they don't have a real chisel in their hand. So the tool that you're using doesn't really matter so long as you get a creative output out of the system. I can go on there for hours. Yeah, that's a, no, no, that's a really, really interesting way to kind of look at it. I like that a lot. Um, and I think you touched on something really important there, which uh, we're about to hop into the Q&A. So I'm going to bully my way in and ask the first question. So you mentioned uh, people maybe using it for as a language tool if English isn't their first language. And that's something I know you've spoke about before, but accessibility and DEI with um, AI, is that something that you could see professors or institutions implementing um, AI tools to benefit students with accessibility requirements? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't know how it works at the higher ed level because I was a K-12 educator before I got into this space, but the, the, the idea of IEPs, right, and differentiated learning, right? So you have your core curriculum, you have your core lesson, but you don't know what students are going to walk into your class and what needs they have, you know, when you wrote that curriculum. So now day one, you see the layout of who's in your class, who has special needs, who has certain learning deficiencies or, or, or learning or, or, or neurodivergent, neurospicy. You know, I love that word where, <laughs> you know, OK, people want to learn this concept in their own way, in different ways. Right. So they could even prompt it where the educator, the, 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 the professor can create a ChatGPT prompt and say, okay, I'm gonna give this to my students where the core lesson is here and the student is gonna put their own variable here of how they want to learn this concept. And in this way, this lesson will be personalized to every single student in the room. Or it will just be rewritten and, and with new assignments, new ways of assessment, whole nine, full stop, soup to nuts of like, I wanna learn it this way. Interesting. So it kind of creates almost an adaptive learning experience for 100%. every single student. 100%. Very cool. All right. So 
Well, we will, I'm sure, lots of questions. Um, so for any of the participants who would like to ask a question, please type it in. There should be a little Q&A box with two chat bubbles in either the top or bottom bar, depending on how you have your Zoom set up. Um, and all we ask is that you're please respectful and refrain from using profanity. This is recorded. Um, so if you say bad stuff, it's out there forever. Um, so let's get our first one here. Um, oh, this is a good one uh, from Caroline. You mentioned how Google makes money from users. Does ChatGPT? ChatGPT uh, has a premium subscription I think it's like 20 bucks a month now. And uh, the platform, so GPT-4 or GPT-3 in the playground um, also has like a pay-as-you-go billing system. So as you generate outputs, you're being billed for your token usage. Um, so currently those are the two methods that I'm aware of at the moment. You know, subscription to ChatGPT as a product or as a developer, you know, pay as you go for the usage, almost like AWS hosting fees. Interesting. Cause I actually, so I, I have the, uh, GPT plus, I think is what they call the subscription yes. one, which gives me access to, uh, GPT four and, uh, it's awesome, but I, it's very nice that unlike Google, you know, there's no advertisements popping up on the side or me having to worry about sponsored content being pushed to me. Um, yeah, and, and nor are the plugins marketplace going to be advertisement because you opt, you install the plugins that you want, right? So you're opting yeah. for the brands that you want to work with. So if you want the kayak plugin because you're trying to plan a trip and you want all the booking to happen with being AI assisted, that would happen in, in ChatGPT by you opting to add kayak. Very interesting. All right. Um, so our next one here, Erwin asks, can you ask for output in the form of PowerPoint slides? Um, it's a good question. Probably not. I haven't tried it, so you could try it. But there are definitely tools that are built with the ChatGPT API that also generate slides. I think Tome is one now, T-O-M-E, where it's a presentation generator that's attached to not only ChatGPT, but also stable diffusion for the images. Um, it kind of brings them together and says, okay, well, generate this slide with this text. Very cool. Because I think right now, so GPT-4 is just text and then Dolly is images. Um, okay, interesting. Perfect. Uh, so the next one here, um, what are what are some strategies to teach students not to make use of the don't list? Um, so I guess kind of how can educators encourage their students to responsibly use um, AI tools? So I'm, I'm glad we got this question asked because I wanted to bring this up in the presentation I, and I <laughs> forgot. It depends on who I'm speaking to because when it's college and some people might, might not like my answer. When it comes to um, K-12 and people who are learning primary education, learning the fundamentals, right? At this age now, we do have to be honest of like, look, I'm pretty sure when using a calculator that when you're grown up, you're gonna use a calculator to do this math. But right now, while you're a young child, you need to learn the muscle memory to do it by hand, just to learn that fundamental skill. And once you learn that fundamental skill, you'll understand how this works when you use it with a calculator. But you know, we, we're not being naive and that as they become adults, they're, they're gonna use a calculator to, to perform that math when they're working out their bills and everything. You're not gonna do it by hand unless you need to. Same applies here. Like it's yes, likely when you get a job or as a professional, you're gonna be using ChatGPT to generate this text. But as a young person, I still need to, to develop the muscle memory for formulating ideas, writing an essay by hand, um, get, going through that process to, to generate ideas and, and craft them and put them together in a sequence that makes sense to put together that narrative. Now that's my conversation to young people as an educator of young people. In college, you are grown as adults. So a professor could be like, if you wanna use AI, go right ahead. You're just making yourself suffer because you're taking a shortcut. And if you wanna become a real professional, and learn these skills, that's on you. I get paid either way. So if you don't want to take the shortcuts and not make yourself a well-rounded professional, good luck to you. 
And because we've got to treat them like adults and we, we can't baby college students the same way that we did with, with young people. So it's really on you. If you want to put in the work, put in the work. If you don't, like you could, you could take a pill to gain muscle, you could do the push-ups. And when it comes to those of us in the room that have written long research papers, 20 pages, you know, minimum, you know, it sucks. But you go through this flow of like that accomplishment of going through it when you're, I just, in one session, you banged out five pages and you feel that flow, almost like running like a marathon. You know, if you, if you use AI for everything long form now, you're never going to know what that experience is like. And you, you're not going to work out that part of your brain to craft long form ideas, right? You're just going to make yourself suffer and have that deficiency. So it's really up to you. That's a really interesting perspective. And I'm really glad that you touched on that about how, I mean, they are college and university students are adults. They're, you know, they're paying to be there. Um, So it's really what they want to get out of it uh, is kind of, you know, you can tell them must like traditional cheating um, or traditional plagiarism. It's no different than copying something off Wikipedia. Um, So I think that's the the conversation surrounding that is very, very similar uh, in regards to academic integrity. And a lot of it is personal responsibility for the student wanting to do a good job. Awesome. Um, sorry. Oh gosh, there's so many questions. Wow, you guys are active. This is great. <laughs> um, all right, here is a very good one from Reza. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, ChatGPT is a new technology. Should we educators learn how to fight it, detecting students cheating, or should we adopt this new technology in education to enhance student learn students learning using the tool? So I do this professionally now. So, you know, I, I get paid to create prompts, to hear a problem from a client and figure out if it can be solved with, with AI. My job is very hard and it takes a lot of critical thinking and creativity and problem solving skills to think about that. So in, in, if you don't treat it like a taboo, you could throw ChatGPT on the table in front of all your students and you say, okay, it's right here. We're not hiding it. I'm not telling you not to use it. Go solve climate change. Go solve world hunger with this AI tool. I don't care what you use. You could use robots, you could use aliens, you could use AI, whatever you think you can use to solve that problem. Because there are a lot of problems and skills that are bigger than the tool that you're using. If there are things that you're giving that could be done by AI in a second, should you be teaching it, period, right? So bigger things like climate change, if you have a solution for that or curing cancer with AI, go go do it. I don't care if you use it or not. So I think you have to look at what you're giving and if if it can be done so easily by ChatGPT in a single sitting, then just get rid of it. It's not worth it, right? Go after the bigger problems that need to be solved. Very cool. So kind of a more taking more of a, I guess, creative approach to learning. Yeah, give them every tool possible to solve a bigger problem and and include a, a, AI in that. That's awesome. And that's something that was touched on earlier was especially entering the workforce is that, you know, these current college and university students, this is something that a tool that they're going to need to know how to use when they enter the workforce. Um, so that's a really good way to look at that. All right, on to our next one from Valerie. Is there potential for unintended discrimination around access for those who are unable to pay for it or for plugins, especially in an educational setting? Um, so kind of the, I guess the, whether it's accessible as a paid tool, I just want to make sure that I'm, understanding that question correctly to pay for it so, okay yeah. yeah so if it's there, giving an unfair advantage i guess to those who can afford to um access it yeah and i, I think the, the, i think we're going to run up against this um in general and and just being a product developer um with things that are what they call freemium or subscription based um and we hear the cliche like if you're not being charged then you're the product you know, it, it, it's true because in the instances where there's going to be a lot of copywriting tools out there that don't charge, what they're taking from you is your data, 
your inputs. They're training their AI on your inputs. And they found more value to their investors in all threads that you're doing with it collectively as a subscriber base and then retraining their AI on that large data set. So now if it's something where there's a subscription and there's an opt out where you say, I don't want you to have my data. I don't want you to have my proprietary information. I don't want you to have any of my conversation threads and I don't want to be advertised to, and I will pay for that. Then there is a value to that, to that subscription. So there is a give and take of like, if you're not being charged, they're going to make their money in other ways by either selling your data or advertising to you. Um, but these, these places, especially because of the computing power and the GPUs that it takes and requires to keep them up and running, there is a hefty, hefty cost to keep the lights on on, on these systems. Um, but there have been programs that we've done with ChatGPT and, and OpenAI where I've done hackathons with, with low-income communities where we've given free training keys, API keys through the hackathon for folks to try it out um, or to give free credits um, to, to use either ChatGPT or Dolly in, in a similar capacity for those who can't afford it. And, and if you are truly representing an organization that works with underserved communities, always reach out, always shoot your shot and say, hey, I wanna do this. I wanna give exposure to this community and to this population. I wanna do a training. Can I get some free accounts, even if they're temporary? Um, and just go that route. Very cool. And cause you, you've done work or sorry, you do currently do some work with Verizon about integrating yes. technology into classrooms that kind of, um, I, I, you'll have to forgive me. I don't recall if it's specifically marginalized groups or if it was just yes, some of is. the. Yeah, they're, they're primarily targeting title one schools, uh, middle, starting with middle schools uh, throughout uh, low income communities. Uh, and title one is identified, obviously, if you, uh, for the majority of free and reduced lunch population um, in the school. And they get fully built out Verizon STEM labs. So 3D printers, VR headsets you know, AR um, on 5G Pro iPads. And um, all of that is handled by people like, oh, it's free. They must be getting my data. They must be trying to sell me a device. That's handled by Verizon's foundation, their CSR arm. So they have to give that money away. So if, if these organizations start putting together these community-based initiatives where there's a bucket of money for that purpose to just give it back to the community or to give free credits, then you'll see more programs like that on the AI side. Very, very cool. Um, all right, so we've got time for a couple more here. Um, Edward, thank you. My cat almost always needs attention. There's one or more of them hovering around at any given time. <laughs> um, he'll get he'll get lots of attention afterwards, I promise. Um, so Tracy here, um, I have just recently discovered the AI screening function in Turnitin. Um, it does not come up automatically, but I accidentally discovered how to show AI contribution in my students' papers. The results were eye-opening. What I want to know is how accurate is the AI screening function in Turnitin? Um, and I actually, I'll expand on that a little. because yeah. I attended a webinar a couple of weeks ago where a similar question came up about just the overall accuracy of any existing AI screening tool out there. And you did touch on it a little bit that where one is set up for GPT-3 and then the next week GPT-4 comes out. Um, but yeah, so just, I guess, how accurate are the AI screening functions out there? Uh, you know, it's scary. And if you're an academic, read the white paper behind Turnitin of how they even develop their technology or, or what methodologies that they're, that they're using. Because what I worry about is a lot of this watermarking, I think relies on these like hidden watermarks, these hidden tokens in the language of like, for instance, we didn't really touch on it, but I have a virtual AI influencer that I've created. Her name is Clara, right? And Clara goes out and speaks around the world and, and she's great, but I notice a tendency in her speaking. She says additionally a lot. So does ChatGPT. I'm like, oh, she kind of gets that from being built on the same thing that ChatGPT is on. Additionally comes out a, a lot. She says, I think a lot, but the watermarking tools, they use that as, as, a, as a crutch, like, okay, as an indicator, they're like, all right, See how often does additionally come up more often than in human language for this thing, or like some type of word that they put in there that it could detect. Now, who's to say that someone who's learning English for the first time doesn't rely on those same, you know, uh, 
you know, sentence structure, you know, habits, you know, as a crutch in, in how they're doing something. So I would hate for these tools to identify and provide false positives of someone using AI in their writing simply because they're new to English or they're not the greatest writers or they, they rely on certain things to do over and over again that might appear as robotic or, or automated, uh, but that might not be the case. So, you know, I, I was a kid, you know, not to go down these rabbit holes, but I was a kid who was low income, did come up from, from the hood and, and was sent into the suburbs and was highly intelligent. And sitting next to an Asian female, we were both taking a test and I aced the test and got accused of cheating because of the stereotype of the fact that I was sitting next to an Asian woman uh, or an Asian student, but she was new to the country and she failed the test and I was helping her cheat. So I was giving her my answers um, to help her along, but I'm the one that got accused because of you know a lot of perception issues. But you know, I know what it feels like to be accused of something that you didn't do, which is my point. And if you are working really hard on something and you submit something and you get an F because they're accusing you of doing something that's AI generated and you're being misleading, I would hate for that to happen for a student. So just make sure whatever tool that you're using that you look under the hood and you read how they're detecting this, what their method is, and if there's a way to check false positives. Awesome. And I think that that's true, I think, for a lot of current technologies, especially, edu especially sorry, educational technologies, is really looking into the ethics of the company behind it and how they're using the data and the information that you're putting in. Um, so this one, this is from Anonymous. Um, the Anonymous? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they showed up. We're so famous. Going viral again, Abron. <laughs> Um, so I'm really curious in creating HR process inventories for businesses. Do you think we will ever have industrial chat pot, chat bots, for example, like chat AI specifically made for Google employees that are used at work, um, that are trained off of organizational documents? That's a really interesting one. So kind of an, an internal chat bot. That is a uh... Great segue. That is my business. So if you want to learn more, <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, that's literally what I do. So yeah, we 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 sit down with corporations and enterprise. We hear out their use case and we say, okay, you know, what's the use? You know, sometimes they don't even know the use. So they we just give them like the API endpoint and then they figure out the use later. Is it going into a chatbot? Is it going into just how they write their internal copy? Is it going into their marketing assets? But we take their data, we custom train an instance on their data and prompt it in a way to make sure that it provides the guardrail so that it operates like a ChatGPT, but is a master of that brand and that product and not only tone and voice, but that product knowledge. So yes, that's, that's currently what we do for enterprise. Very, very cool. All right. So we have two minutes remaining and there are still a bunch of questions, um, but I am going to, some of them are similar. So I'm going to kind of group them here. Um, all right, so this one from Christina. Um, do you have suggestions to reduce the risk of cheating when integrating AI into a college writing course? How can we motivate students to use it ethically? And I think we did, you did kind of touch on that with academic integrity as a whole, where I guess the motivation kind of is internal for them. But yeah, specifically for integrating into a college writing course, if you have any I don't know, insight saw, uh, as to how you could do that properly. Yeah, I saw <laughs> someone in the chat already answered it. So I, I was oh, peeking okay. and um, I forgot who said it, but someone mentioned that they allow their students to use it, but then the students have to evaluate the quality of the, the con contributions from the AI and, and write more of a, you know, meta like overview of like, this is how I use the AI. Th these are the contributions from the AI. And these are my uh, views on, and, and my assessment of the AI's contributions to the piece. Um, so this is my overall piece. This is what I contributed. This is what the AI contributed. But then here's almost like this appendix of like, here's where it contributed and where I felt like I needed to rephrase and rewrite and get it right into my tone of voice. Because you're getting the AI to match your tone of voice and your writing style is an assignment in and of itself. So it's not like they're, like you said, they're doing the work. 
right? It's just, what are you evaluating? And you we need to reevaluate what we're evaluating um, because they are putting in a lot of time and effort and staying up till four in the morning to prompt the hell out of that to make sure that it matches their tone and their style. Awesome. That's yeah, it's uh, it's something that even I've noticed one of the earlier, um, I don't think it was a language processing model, but uh, copy AI yes. um, is one that has been around for a while and was my mm -hmm. first kind of adventure into the world of AI tools. And it was very interesting to see, like you said, generate the prompts that would get the answer that I wanted in the tone of voice or in my style of speaking, which is, yeah, like you said, that is an assignment all on its own. <laughs> That's literally what I pay the prompt engineers on my team to do when I'm like, all right, we have this enterprise client. They gave us a sample of their copy. It needs to be in this tone and voice. It is your job to make sure that the AI output matches that brand's style. Um, and so Prompt engineering is going to be a very, and is already a very important job skill, and it's going to become more important as the years come. So don't discount that. Make sure that you're you're embracing that you're also teaching prompt engineering in how you give assignments to, to hone that, that skill and cultivate it. Interesting. Awesome. Cool. Well, we have we've a little tiny bit over time, so I'll hop to the, the final slide. Um, but there is one question here that I do want to have a broad answer before we hop off uh, from Edward. For most participants, it might be beneficial to let them know how to access ChatGPT and its connectors and extenders. Um, so Abron, if people want to test out ChatGPT for themselves, play around with it, where do they go? What do they do? They go to chat.openai.com. Um, if you want to get into the back end of chat um, GPT, the, that is platform.openai.com. Wonderful. And I will include a link to all of this in the follow up email for attendees. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for attending and spending your afternoon with us. Uh, keep an eye on your inbox for the next session information, the recording of today's webinar. And do not forget to go follow Abron on social media. Uh, in the email that I send out, it will have a link to his LinkedIn um, and all of his various social media accounts so you can keep up to date with what he and his team are doing. And a giant thank you to Abron for joining us and being a phenomenal guest. Uh, this was wonderful. Appreciate y'all. Stay creative. Go have fun. <laughs> awesome. Take care, everyone.